Good morning. My name is Andy Lidston. I'm a Principal Consultant with Ristec Solutions Limited, part of the TV Rhineland Group. Today I would like to introduce the ideas behind bow tie analysis and potentially how they can be used to manage hazards within your operating companies. Again, thank you so much for giving your time out. Um, what we wanted to do, start showing this as a, um, an example workshop. So we want to go through the basic processes of this and to start building it all up. And then we can show you, a, if you like, a fully completed one at the end of it. So as a, a general um, approach, what we, the scenario would be that we're looking at a, um, a gas pipeline, um, cross country gas pipeline um, running within the United Kingdom. Um, and that we are the duty holders we want to be able to satisfy our shareholders and HSE that we are managing our risks effectively. We've done some form of hazard identification that has said that if we were to have a release from uh, this gas pipeline, then we have the potential for a major accident hazard to occur. And therefore we need to provide a demonstration of managing that risks. Um, typically that's where bow ties are going to fit in. They're going to come after the hazard identification, um, something that said that this is the area of concern. So the hazard is going to be hydrocarbon gas in the pipeline. The top event, the zero consequence, is the point where we lose control of the hazard. We've had a loss of containment. First step within the bow tie then is what are the potential causes? What are credible scenarios that might lead us to a loss of containment. Third party, Third party interference. Yeah. Okay. Internal corrosion. Internal corrosion might give us a potential for release. Would external corrosion also be a... Okay. External corrosion. Um, cracking? Cracking in what sort of uh, sense? Stress stress uh, okay, so stress is, is that part something that you would consider as part of internal corrosion or is it external, separate? I think it's very in vogue at the moment. Right. Yeah. The way I guess we do things we will actually split it into internal corrosion, external corrosion, and standalone stress corrosion. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other possible causes? Yeah. And um, so geohazards in what sort of sense? Sand slip. Land, land slip. Okay. Um, flooding, I guess. Yeah. Well, so you know, like uh, flooding and erosion might be. Okay. So we yeah. deal, possibly deal with that one as a, as a, a separate um, issue at, at that point. Okay. So that would be both temperature and uh, cycling or introducing fatigue into a, into the system okay i we when we, we're drawing up the the bow ties um things like incorrect uh, well it, we would put in all of the possible causes um incorrect operations tends to be a bit nebulous uh, but a human error possibly causing something is a a, a possible uh, cause um would you have systems error as well then in okay. what as sense as in if you had um automatic systems in place to control and pressure certain things and that's it right as opposed to human error yeah whereby they did hmm. something wrong right now one of the things we try to avoid within a, a bow tie um, is failure of a barrier oh, does okay. not cause, so the fa failure of a monitoring device does not necessarily result in the loss of containment. It's the, it only becomes an issue if the monitoring device fails to detect no, the cause. I think what we're, we think now of the term of human error and all my control mm. is, is not necessarily the monitoring side of things, but the, the actual operation, so choosing to make it function in a certain way. So right. So opening valves to allow pressure into the system. Yeah. Because that's a, a function of how you would operate it. But 
incorrectly opening two into it and doubling the pressure one. Like yeah, so like yeah, mm. pressure surge is due to sort of. Okay. The, the, common, yeah. the common failure for the pipelines is having uh, a valve incorrectly shut when it shouldn't. So you should lower the pressure before you shut a valve. Yeah. Shutting a valve can cause a pressure spike. Mm. So, the, yeah. but then, but then, the cause of the failure is the pressure. Yeah. That the yeah. Yeah. So, so, the, so That's the, the yeah. so the pressure is the potential cause that results in the loss of containment. Right. One of the things you have in place to manage that is the automation system. So, so that's a positive thing, yeah. if you like. That's a that becomes a barrier at that point. Yeah. Those give us a, at least a starting point. We can, if there are more things that come up during the discussion, then we can add those onto that list. So all of these can result in loss of containment. If we have a loss of containment, what are we worried about? What are the potential consequences arising from this? Okay, from, from a fire. So fire, fire resulting in fatalities. Okay. Um, would it be beneficial for your understanding of the risk and the way that you manage the risk? Do we need to dis differentiate between worker fatalities within the fence line and public fatalities outside of it? Or probably not. No. no, for a pipeline, you would probably not expect. No. Yeah. For a long pipeline, yeah. you would not expect to yeah. differentiate between the yeah. two. Okay. If you're working on a pipeline that's in, the, in the facility or near a in the facility near a, a fence line, mm -hmm. maybe you would start to look at right. it. Okay. So, so that one of the consequences is going to be an ignited release resulting in uh, a fire causing fatalities, something along those lines. Um, would you sort of break it down into immediate ignition, delayed ignition? Delayed ignition could result in a flash yeah. fire on the wall. Um, or would it just blow up? I think the safe the same. Yeah, I, I think for for yeah. completeness, I think what we could do is to put in a second consequence of um, a delayed ignition resulting in a, a, a flash fire fireball or an explosion. Um, if we, when we look at it, then we find that the consequences are going to be largely the same. We can um, deal with it at that point. Would we? We're not really. Do we need to consider? Uh, pollution events or unignited releases to them? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's not going to be an issue. Um, as duty holders, mostly um, we're going to be worried about the safety impacts. Do we need to worry about um, loss of supply or interruptions to supply? Yeah, well, that's not very concerning. Hmm. Okay. So. Um, and, and what you will tend to find on as a bow tie, they don't tend to look very much like bow ties. <laughs> uh, you do tend to finish up with a lot more a lot more causes than you do consequences. When we start looking at the the controls, the barriers in place, those barriers have to relate to those potential consequences. Now, in reality, the reputational damage is only going to arise from the ignited release and the fatalities that result at that point. But most of the barriers that we will have to manage that are going to be related to the fires and the prevention of harm to people. The prevention of harm to the reputation will have a completely separate set of controls in place for that. So it might well be, it's generally useful to keep that as a separate consequence at that point. Okay, so if we go back to looking at the, so the basic structure of the bow tie, this causes this, results in this. Once we've got to the, the top event, we're not really worried about it. So it's not, so all of the, uh, the threats can result in the top event. Once we've got to the top event, all of these are potential outcomes at that point. Um, we're not trying to tie individual threats to individual consequences. So we said third party interference. Okay, so for the pipeline that you are the duty holders for, that you are responsible, what are the barriers that we have? What are you relying on? What allows you to sleep at night? 
what we're trying to do with the bow tie is to make sure that somebody who's not present within the meeting could understand it. Um, if we just put in two words, then it all makes perfect sense to all of us when we're sat in the room. And then two weeks later, you're looking at this, you're thinking mechanical design. What, what did I actually mean about that? What, what specific property? Because if you're going to start claiming specific properties, I want to be able to go out and verify that this barrier is going to work. So I've got to have something that allows me to audit that sort of level. Now, it probably wouldn't be useful to say mechanical design to withstand a 200 pound impact at a certain velocity. That's going to get a bit more detail, but okay. So, all right, that's one of the things we've got. Okay, so we've got Derby for you. Surveillance activities, so like the, the yeah. line walking, uh, aerial surveillance. Okay. So, surveillance activities such as line walking, aerial surveillance, etc. Okay. Okay. And as you can see up there, what we try, what we find generally makes it easier is to put these in the order in which they occur. Um, so, the, the, the mechanical design is the first layer of protection, if you like, that, that we have in place for that. Um, and then we bury it and then we will look after it. So that's the order in which these com the controls tend to apply at, at that point. Um, okay, so in terms of the mechanical design, um, in terms of what we would like to try and do is to, to gauge how effective you think these um, these these barriers are so on a scale of one to what are we doing there one to three um, so th this is a, a, a simple definition uh, so that the the definition we've got is that a barrier is either effective it functions when we need it to to work. Um, that it will continue. It's poor, so it's, it's no. very poor, poor, good, and very good. Right. Okay. So, we've got a scale of one to four. As I said, you can tailor this to whatever level of detail you need to work to. Um, typically, some operating companies we use one to three worst I've ever, or the most detailed I've ever done is on a scale of one to 10. Okay, so for your pipeline, do you have any concerns for the, the system that we've got out there at the moment? Are there any areas where it's weaker? Are there any activities where possibly it's leading to our burial depth is not what we originally said it should be? Well, I think the concern is the first thing. 50 years ago, it might have been in an empty field and now yeah. it's in a construction site. Okay. Yeah, especially <laughs> with the first one, the mechanical design, talk yeah. about um, the capabilities of excavators and things are vastly mm. superior. Yeah. Right. See what they were. Okay. So, so, right. So, so one of the, the degradation factors for the first barrier is the fact that we are designed against, um, we'll say, 50 year old standards mm. and that the impact is impact levels are potentially higher nowadays yeah. it's, it's very easy for me to sit here and say all of this stuff and then <laughs> your your poor scribe has to, has, has to type all of this stuff in at that point Can we come up with a good way of wording that? so <coughs> historical <coughs> design standards uh, historical design standards um, may not be sufficient or yeah. not sufficient um, for, for modern excavation yeah yeah that's so it's important to to represent that the the bow tie that we draw we draw up at the end of this represents the design that you're considering, not um, not what you wish is there, but what you are actually managing at this moment in time. So you've said to me then that one of the barriers you have in place is the against. Third-party interference is the mechanical design strains on this. Now you've said that our facility is 
Um, over time, the wall thickness has reduced. Therefore, that has led to a degradation of the quality of the wall thickness as a barrier. So do we have anything in place that acts to mitigate against that degradation factor? Um, so are we like, if you did, when you come down to design initially, you have the uh, external court and all the pipelines, so then you have the external court and the visible. But this is again that could also degrade over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, I guess you'd have to start with the inline inspection and uh, mm. pinpoint like areas. Mm. All, all of which we're, we'll, we'll possibly deal with, we, we can deal with when we get to the, um, the external corrosion. I mean, in, in terms of, so the, the, but the, the specific scenario we're worried about at the moment is that we have less protection against somebody putting a JCB into it because we're not as strong as we used to be. Um, is in terms of you managing those risks, do we have anything that allows us to manage that? What we can do is I by Nuna can go in and install protective barriers, concrete slabs, and things. Yep. but that's obviously very location specific. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if there are areas that they're concerned about, um, yep. they could go go ahead and put in some okay. mitigation so without working on the pipeline itself. Yes. So they could put slabs above it. So yeah, okay. Like so that. so for our example pipeline at the moment, can we assume that this is being done? Right. So, right. So, so one of the barriers we've got is that the the pipeline operator is inspecting that uh, inspecting areas of potential weakness and is putting additional protection in place for that. Okay. Okay, and that would be then a, as a reasonably effective barrier. You have a for the location specific. Okay. Okay. If we've got, if we have identified potential risk reduction measures that we don't have in place at this moment, then we can place an action in there to, to deal with this. So we can, okay, so we could add an action in of work that needs to be done. So, uh, so what do we actually re what do we want so what do we want for the operator to do at this point do we want them to conduct a survey to identify if there are any areas where there is significant damage and that they need to replace sections it, it may be that um, the operator has done a survey and they found out the section no longer meets the code yeah. that's required so they might have to replace that particular section Okay, so we can we can put in an action, and um, we would then also to make sure that our actions were smart, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time based. Um, to put in all of the additional information at that point uh, about who's responsible for doing that at that point. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> if we were looking at, again at burial, so you were talking then about burial depth um, and our pipeline has been out there for 30, 40 years. There are going to be some areas potentially where farmers have taken away the topsoil or construction activities have taken away the topsoil. We're not buried as much. as. How would we know? Can you measure burial depth? Yes. No, you really can because the UK launch our guys do it don't. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's also about keeping it, keeping whoever's around the pipeline involved and where the pipeline is. So that they know. So I guess not to go and have found nodes not to go and shun soil off. Yes. Yeah. So is that a responsibility of the, the pipeline operator to make sure that the Quite commonplace, you get like the public awareness campaigns. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And like the knowing yeah. that like the farmer knowing that there's a pipeline running through its fields, mm. so not um, mm. carry out a lot of significant 
Yeah. yeah. So right. is that, and is, that's then a responsibility of the the duty holder, the pipeline operator, to to make sure to make sure that the public are aware of these things. From a um, a workshop perspective, um, what we generally don't try to do is to record all of the the information about safety critical activities within it be, purely because it tends to get a bit more uh, it can interrupt it but given that we're having this conversation now uh, just to sort of um, to show how we can build this information into the bow tie at, at this point so we're saying then that the the responsibility of so what has to happen to allow for this barrier to work? Who, who has to do something? Is it the pipeline operator has to accept responsibility for this, conducting these public awareness campaigns? Yeah. 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 Now, what you can see up there is um, we've created a, if you like, a, a, a dummy management system. Um, this is just to allow us to file things so that we can file, find them at a later system. It allows us to find um, key pieces of information and to have new memories. Now, when, we talk, when we're talking about the safety critical activities, we tend to think about what has to happen, who's got the responsibility for doing it, why are they doing it, and how I could audit that it's actually been done. So we've got then a, a reference number to just show what it is, a brief description of the activities that we're expecting to to happen and um, we've assigned that to a responsible party person at that point. Now, from an audit point of view, how could you guys audit that this had actually been done without you actually going out and speaking to the farmer and has something, um, but if you were to do a management system audit of the, the operation of this pipeline, we've now just claimed that this activity makes sure that this barrier works. If you put your auditor hats on now, what evidence would, it, how could you prove that this is? Letters, something like that being sent out. Okay. You'd have to have anyone who went to visit the farm or to visit, 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 reports. visit reports, yeah. um, copies of correspondence sent to people. That, that would be our audit trail for this. Yeah. Okay, so we've created a critical activity. Um, we've made it the responsibility of an individual person. What we would recommend to you is that the, it goes to an individual position. Um, not an individual name because pe people will always move in and out of jobs. But what we try to do is to put it to an individual, a craft level, if you like. So it would be the instrument technicians or the, um, the maintenance crews or the HSE department manager. It's, it's, a, it's a set position. That then we've taken that job and attached that job to this barrier. So that barrier the, that job getting done allows for this to work. Therefore, we can audit that job. We can audit that barrier. If we, that barrier works, then we're managing the hazards. Okay. So <clears throat> you've also claimed we've got a dial before you dig system. Um, that's there to alert people to the presence of pipelines. How does Joe Public know that there is an issue or uh, is that a concern oh am i correct in, in saying that the um the threat that we've got here at the moment is third party in a, the interference and that's more the accidental yeah either so another possible th cause would be um deliberate third party interference that and so the controls we've been talking about would not be relevant for that. Then we'll have different controls for that. So we'll have to deal with that as a separate threat. And then surveillance activities. So in terms, so we've got aerial surveys, you've got uh, line walking. Um, in terms of the effectiveness of those preventing third party, 
how much faith do you have? Uh, faith. Not much. Yeah. Not much. Because <laughs> it's like, if, even if you do it every week, you, you've got to be passing that mm. point. Mm. At that, but yes. I think, yeah. I think there's quite a good record of them um, preventing damage to pipelines. Mm. Yeah. Whether they prevent a failure, because mm. a failure, chance of a failure occurring, mm. occurring is hopefully uh, very low. So you probably prevent uh, damage to your pipeline or interference. Mm. Okay. So we can, again, depend on how much information we want to record within this. But um, if you're building up a bow tie, um, having a good scribe is really useful. Um, um, but you can also record additional pieces of information um, that might be useful to you at some point in the future. Um, and then, as we said, we put in place there something to say that that's not actually that effective at that point. So in terms of the um, the barriers we've got in place, we're relying on the mechanical integrity of the pipeline system, which we said has degraded over time. We have an action to, to look at whether or not we can improve that. Um, by putting in place additional barriers. We're relying on the burial depth and the awareness of the pipeline routes, the, the marking points of that, and also the surveillance activities. Um, and we've gone through and started looking at the effectiveness of those. What we can do as part of this discussion is when we're doing basic risk management, we need to identify what we have, we need to identify how good our controls are, and then to ask ourselves, is that an acceptable level of risk? Given these levels of controls, given how likely the potential threat is, is this acceptable to us? And also, under the ALARP principle, start asking ourselves, could we do anything more at that point? So. If you, as the responsible operators for this pipeline facility, that's what we've got. That's how you're managing your pipelines at the moment with regards to this threat. Is this acceptable? As the duty holder for this level of risk, are we comfortable that this represents a tolerable level of control for this risk? I mean, the fact that we have raised action items means that we are trying to improve the level of risk. Um, from an alarm point of view, you also have the ability, sometimes we'll do this as a separate workshop, um, and sometimes we'll do it as part of this workshop, but could we do anything that would improve the quality of any of our barriers? And or could we put an additional barrier in place? And again, it's a lot of the time when we're building up bow ties to start continually asking questions about this. So that would be how we build. Typically, we build up the bow tie by each threat path, looking at the controls, looking at the potential questions. Is there anything that might break this? And then looking at asking questions about the effectiveness, asking questions about the um, the activities that go behind it. There is, depending on the complexity, you need to be realistic that you are going to have to do some work outside of a bow tie in a workshop. Um, there is a bit of tidying up goes on, even if you have a very good scribe. On the right hand side, um, we made the comment earlier that um, people, some people will view a bow tie as the fault, the left hand side is the fault tree. So that's the causal paths we've just gone through. The right hand side is the event tree, how it develops over time. So the top event is time equals zero. The consequence is at some point in the future. So what we try to do is to put the barriers in, in the order that they will be applied. So for whatever reason, we've now had a release of gas. How do you know about it? 
if we if we we're, so we're dealing with a cross country gas trundle line. If we have a major release of gas, that's the scenario we're worried about. How do we know about it? There is going to be a, I, I'm guessing a some form of cut off as to the sensitivity of this. So you, it's it's going to pick up major releases, but we've got scala monitoring indicates pressure drop, loss of flow. Now, what we would try to do, um, it's not always as effective, but we try to make sure that all of the barriers should be have the elements of detect, decide, and act. So what is the sh what, it, what claim are you making that the SCALA system is actually doing? Is it just raising an alarm? Are you triggering automatic isolation and blowdown? Or how does this function? Both. It could be depending on your pipeline. Hmm. Uh, okay, so... <coughs> So for, for our imaginary yeah. trunk line pipeline, are we expecting that the SCADA raises an alarm and the operator investigates? Oh, or? Expect them to, yeah, raise an alarm if it was sufficient, that we're saying it's an yeah. alarm rupture, yeah. it would trigger an alarm, but it would almost certainly automatically activate. Yeah. I don't know whether you do that, because would you want to cut off the main supply? I think you probably want some verification yes. first. So uh, again, we're the, it's important that we build up the bow tie yeah. as the representation of our system. If, if this was a, um, a pipeline within an offshore platform, then you would have, as soon as we got um, positive gas detection, the isolation valves will close. Yeah. Because we're dealing with this as a trunk line, the claim is actually that the operator investigates. That gives us a far different risk picture than we would otherwise have. So we've, we've said we've got the SCADA monitoring, that's gonna give us um, an indication and there may be some things that could act to weaken um, that. Um, I keep on coming back to this, that what we're trying to do is to represent the, the actuality of what we have. So most of the time, we would be trying to put in place for every time we have a degradation factor, we would need to have a control in place to make sure that we were managing that. There may be some cases where you put down a degradation factor and you say, yeah, this is just how the world works. Um, but it's important to be able to present that picture so that everybody's got a thorough understanding of this is what we have, that we have this barrier, this is going to weaken this barrier and we cannot do anything more about it at that point. Okay, <coughs> so we've got we know we've got a problem. We've got the means of detecting the problem. We've got isolation valves. Okay, we're still releasing gas at this point. Emergency response plans. Oh, well, okay, so what do you want? What do you want for these emergency response plans to say? Because an emergency response plan is just a piece of paper. What What do you want? What are you going? What claim are you going to make at this point? Well, what act physically you're actually going to do? What resources? How long is it going to take? Like okay, so <laughs> Would the, um, I'm sorry, I'll come back to you in a moment. But I mean, again, I'm I'm thinking of this in part from the point of view of the the auditors that if we just write up on a bow tie that emergency response plans, I can go out and I can audit. Oh yes, they have an emergency response plan. I expect it to be tested. Right. Possible. Okay. Or evidence that you've actually tested. Yeah. I mean, are, are you claiming as a the duty holder that you're going to be fighting fires and dealing with people? Or are you just claiming that your emerg that the level of risk control you've got is that the emergency response plan is going to try and clean up things? There's no real right way to draw a bow tie. There's plenty of wrong ways. But <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's a case of the more you get into the nitty gritty. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the, Solutions mm. on these things. Yeah. Do you want to go back and, like you said, edit them to maybe join them together? Yeah, I, I know. Realize that maybe you haven't made the right decision at the start. And, and go mm. back, but you have to go through the process to. Yeah, and and a lot of it is just being in the position of questioning it. Mm. Is why are we sure that this is going to work? Can I break this barrier? 
And so, as I've said, you coming back to the question I gave you earlier, you, you've claimed you're going to notify the emergency services. If, if we are relying on the SCADA system and you have said to me, the SCADA system is going to give us a indication of a release. How accurate is that going to be? It's one of the challenges of doing of representing with a bow tie in that yeah. you can use the bow tie to tell the story and to identify the major con uh, the controls that you've got and to question those controls. If you approach it from the point of view of an inventory, then you've got actually you can say, well, if this happens, then I've gone down this branch, and then that means I can go down these branches, and you, you can go into a lot more sequential logic on that which within a bow tie we can't do that sort of sequential logic yes, you'd almost want another one beyond it wouldn't you yes and then, and then none of this would be before that one. and then you'd put them after it to stop further yeah the so it, it's so it, just briefly while we're doing that would you consider consequences with time period and this one we said immediate ignition and we're saying yeah. maybe it's immediate and continued but yep. would there be uh would it be a good idea to split that out into di different time periods like you've seen in the eventually um, or does bowtie work better by identifying a, a likely consequence and considering um around yeah i personally i would tend to go with um a, a immediately uh, a, a fire a, a release that results in a fire results in fatalities and I would tend to have a release that results in an explosion resulting in fatalities if only because there would be slightly different controls between them I wouldn't personally differentiate between whether or not it was an immediate ignition or whether it was a delayed ignition um, but Again, it, it very much comes down to how much detail you want to go into it. Different people will take it different ways, and both of the uh, coming up with a prolonged fire might be of concern for you. I mean, we've had plenty of um, accident scenarios where we have had prolonged fires, which have led to domino effects, which have led to something else. And so, if that is of concern to you, then that is worth identifying at that point. What you will find is that a lot of the times, a lot of controls that you put on one branch, you're going to copy them and repeat down on the next branch. You need to consider the usability of this and what you're doing it for. If you want it as a very detailed analysis for a loss adjuster or a, um, a risk assessor, then fine, that doesn't really matter if you're wanting to do something that you want to be able to communicate to the public about these are the things we are doing this is why we think you should be happy about having our pipeline and you walk into a meeting and you've got something that is eight feet tall um, and is fantastically detailed but just scares the willies out of everybody it's not doing its job at that point um, any more questions about how we and this is basically you build it up so build the left hand side question the barriers record the additional information that so the additional information might typically tends to be the effectiveness rate tends to be the information about the safety critical activities that we've um, shown you and, and collected we could also add in the safety critical equipment so um, if we are claiming on there that we've got the automatic isolation valves then um, it's useful um, if we are wanting to identify what our safety critical elements are um, and then to then document within that so that we can attach and display that information on there um, it's not something we'll necessarily go into in detail within this, but you could then link from that safety critical equipment to the performance standard associated with that safety critical equipment. And so you, if 
you're using this as an online tool that allows you to track all of that information at that point, if that would be useful to you. Um, the only other thing I would show on there is that, um, could we do the risk scoring? So, um, okay, so level of risk, how bad, how often? Um, so in terms of the, so let's, I'm more comfortable dealing with the inherent level of risk. So you've said to me, we have the potential for a release of gas that would cause multiple fatalities. Okay, so do we think on the scale shown in there, is that likely, unlikely? I mean, what, what, what is the risk score that we're dealing with at this point? Credible worst case. You haven't really got any numbers. That's very unlikely. Too. Yeah, depending on how it's calibrated. Yeah, yeah pipeline like risk will lower. Okay, so very unlikely. Yeah. Okay, um, in terms of asset damage, we're dealing with a cross country pipeline. Um, so we're talking huge. I'm. If you believe it, use the pipeline. Okay. Then you're going to lose the section. But the interruption costs. Yeah. That's yeah. True. Okay, yeah. so again, there's um, environmental damage, apart from burning down a couple of trees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, okay, so yeah. unlikely, uh, not very much. Okay, and reputational damage, you're not having a good day. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be international impact, but nationally, yeah. Okay, so. We have the ability, again, your bow ties, your representation, if you wish to, you can call inherent and residual risk. You can make the, the matrix look like your own personal matrix. And then um, to show that as a, an individual thing on there at that point. Reputational risk tends to result from the um, the actual event that you've got, but I, this is a question that you asked earlier. I think what you are dealing with on this consequence branch is the major consequence, which is the loss of life. Now, as a, a pipeline operator, you, we would need to question, do you have emergency response plans to deal with interruptions to supply, to deal with crisis management, personal, public relations, etc. I think it would be better to keep that on a separate consequence rather than to start, start claiming that as a barrier on this consequence line. So when you suggested earlier that we would have a separate consequence for that, the, yes, that, that's why I would agree with you. So you could put in your crisis response plans down there for the things that you're doing to, to manage interruption to supply and reputational damage. Okay. And largely that's sort of how we build up a bow tie. As, as an example, we've got a, um, a fully completed bow tie. Um, this is for a pipeline operator uh, outside of the UK. Um, yeah, that one. And so you just do, uh, do it as six. And so you can sort of see the how big these can get um, quite quickly. Now you can always cut it up and just show little bits at various times. But um, again, these, the, the bow ties can get quite large. But if you've spent a bit of time talking about it, you should be able to present a bow tie to anybody and they should be able to understand the logic. This is what can go wrong. These are the barriers I've got. This is how it stops it from happening. And this is how I'm gonna mitigate it at that point. That's, you want by and large your bow tie to be understandable by your target audience. That might be the public, the regulator, the loss prevention department, or the senior management. They've all got different sort of target audiences, if you like, at that point. Okay. Um.
Well, thank you very much for your time.